Hello, and welcome to our panel on Bodies and Structures, Deep Mapping Modern East Asian History. Um, my name is Kate McDonald. I'm from the University of California, Santa Barbara, and I am here with my project co-director, um, David Ambaris from the uh, North Carolina State University. And for the first part of our presentation, just to kick off this panel, what we'd like to do is give you a very brief um, overview of what we try to achieve with this digital spatial history site. Um, and then following the presentations from our three panelists, we will return with more discussion about what, um, what you can actually do with this site. So um, first, let me give you information on how to access the site. The um, URL for the Bodies and Structures 1.0 is bodiesandstructures.org. And then we are currently in the process of putting together a second edition of the site, which we hope to release in September 21, with significant funding from the National Endowment for the Humanities. So you'll see what you'll see today is a collection of materials from Bodies and Structures 1.0, which you can see now, and then materials from Bodies and Structures 2.0, which is not yet available to the public, but will be soon. So what is Bodies and Structures? First, it's a platform for researching and teaching spatial histories of modern East Asia. Second, it's a digital environment that reflects the depth of scholarship emerging on the subject. Third, it's a collaborative enterprise. And fourth, it is an ongoing conversation. So the key questions that we ask in our project are how we can analyze and visualize space and place as processes and products, not as an empty expanse of absolute space or a neutral container of human and non-human action. Um, and we wanna consider what ways we can express spatial relationships other than through the so-called God's eye view of the cartographic uh, map. How can we analyze and represent the multivocality of space? Here we take inspiration in particular from Doreen Massey's formulation that space is a simultaneity of stories so far. And so we want to think about how the digital environment enables us to engage with that kind of thought process. And through that, we want to think about um, how all of this can help us to create new knowledge about humanity's pasts. So today, uh, we're going to have presentations from three of our team members. Sakura Christmas, Maren Ehlers, and Peter Tilly. Each of them is contributing a module to version 2.0 of Bodies and Structures. These modules are currently under construction. They will be uh, presenting in separate videos. And after um, you've watched their videos, please come back and join us as we talk more about Scalar and the analytical tools that Bodies and Structures offers. Hello, my name is Sakura Christmas and I teach at Bowdoin College. Uh, this is my presentation on my Bodies and Structures module, Imperial Japan Up in the Air. Now, this module examines how the aerial perspective as made possible by aviation helps Japanese occupiers imagine the Eurasian continent in its uh, supposed geographical vastness. Um, and yet, the module also explains how uh, ter uh, terrestrial limitations ultimately failed to sustain uh, control uh, over this particular space. Uh, so for uh, Imperial Japan, the Manchuria Aviation Company, the Manchu Koku Koku Kabushiki Kaisha, uh, founded in 1932, uh, would become the predominant presence over Inner Asia during the wartime era, and this is the focus of this particular module. Now, uh, the advent of aviation in the early 20th century opened up an uncertain and contingent space of the Japanese empire. Um, it allowed for uh, friction between various borders that didn't really align so neatly between land, sea, and the air. And this is what I'm most interested in here. And this new form of transportation superseded earlier networks of ships and rail, and it ex extended the Japanese empire westward uh, from Manchukuo uh, in 1931 uh, into Inner Mongolia and then uh, beyond the uh, for, uh, formal reaches of its control. Now, uh, Kate McDonald and David Ambrose uh, have asked us uh, to discuss uh, two issues. 
Number one, how do we use the site to reflect on the kinds of spaces, places, and modes of being in and seeing the world that are excluded from the operations of hegemonic cartographic rationality? This is what I'll explain now. Uh, and then number two, how uh, did the collaborative process of module development um, helped us uh, to write multivocal spatial histories? And this is what I'll explain uh, at the end of my presentation. Now, um, within this particular module, uh, I am interested in uh, four uh, potential um, uh, avenues of um, uh, new uh, spatial uh, perspectives. And so uh, the first one has to do with how aviation technology superseded railroad imperialism. Uh, this is a particular uh, problem um, that uh, the scholarship on Inner Asia focuses on. It dates back to Owen Lattimore, who was writing in the 1930s, uh, who argued that the uh, railroads um, fundamentally broke and transfigured the relationship between nomadic and sedentary societies, um, and it ultimately led to the downfall of uh, the Mongols. Now, of course, in this particular module, um, the uh, airlines are another level beyond that. Uh, and what's really particularly interesting is the ways in which uh, Japanese spatially conceived of um, airplanes themselves as new kinds of nomads uh, in inner Asia. Um, now, uh, the second um, uh, issue that I'm interested in, of course, is the ability to challenge territorially based uh, borders uh, within uh, the Japanese empire the um, airplanes um, actually go beyond what has been formally uh, negotiated uh, between uh, various powers. Um, and then, of course, um, that uh, Japanese imperialists themselves are um, uh, seeking to replace earlier forms of cartographic hegemonic rationality with this new form in and of itself. So this is not a module that intends to challenge or, or subvert uh, norms, but um, a way to read um, new uh, rationalities um, that are emerging at this time. Uh, and then last but not least, I'm interested in revealing the shortcomings of this new rationality by focusing on the process in which that they were constructed. Now, uh, between the modules, um, there are also new spaces uh, being opened up. Uh, first and foremost, uh, this module emphasizes the importance of spatial imagination, and in that it is in conversation with, uh, say, for example, uh, Noriko Aso's uh, module on Mitsukoshi. Um, it is also interested in linking together similar media produced at different scales. Uh, so on the one hand, we have the intimate family photographs um, by Emily Chapman. On the other hand, we have the uh, distant, um, putatively uh, objective renderings of aerial photography in this particular uh, module. Um, third, uh, the... Um, uh, this module questions this portrayal of a reality as only spectacularly destructive, um, which of course is seen in the kind of warfare uh, that we see uh, with uh, Michitake Aso's module or David Fedman's module, um, who uh, look at um, colonial Vietnam and then subsequently the Tokyo air raids. Uh, aerial moder modernity uh, represented more than uh, just that spectacular violence. There is slow epistemic violence to consider here too. And last but not least, um, I contrast my perspective on nomadic practice uh, with the one put forth uh, by Shellen Wu, who is uh, interested in uh, Chinese uh, attempts at settler colonialism to assimilate uh, Mongols into the uh, Republican nation state. Now, uh, the contents um, of this module can be um, ordered in any fashion, uh, but I am going to go through it in the order um, in which it's presented in the module, but users can click through any one of them. The first one um, is a perspective made possible by spatial imaginaries, um, which are basically unlimited by the constraints of physics. Uh, the second one, one is the perspective made possible by planar or two-dimensional space. Um, and so here, uh, this perspective concerns the expansion of aerial routes and conflicts with territorial boundaries. Um, and finally, the third is the perspective made possible by volumetric or three-dimensional space. So this is the view from above and what that allows for in terms of the creation of um, aerial photographs. So this first perspective about the spatial imaginary, I explore that through uh, the reading of uh, Man Air Magazine, which is the Manchuria Aviation Company's um, corporate 
um, publication. Uh, so here we have different covers uh, demonstrating um, some of the major themes um, that um, I found. These are not tied to chronology, but more about the imaginative spaces that exist over the course of the 1930s. Uh, they draw out some of these major topics. Um, which um, and ultimately how they might have shaped discourse about politics, about capitalism, and about technology. So, uh, for example, um, these include themes about the corporate branding, the technological sublime, uh, the culture of tourism, the geographic imaginary, as you see here, and gender and childhood. The second pathway uh, about a two dimensional uh, planar. Um, uh, perspective uh, focuses on Eurasian expansion. Uh, and so this is um, a pathway that narrates the spread of the aerial network well beyond the formal territorial boundaries of the Japanese empire. Um, but uh, the Japanese occupiers themselves could never really fully escape the territorial problems because it first had to create an infrastructure of airports on the ground through tremendously difficult terrain, uh, as you see here on the map to the bottom, which is in the module through the Gobi Desert. Uh, second, it had to uh, negotiate with Mongol princes on the ground uh, who were playing off the various powers against each other. Uh, third, it had to contend with the Chinese reaction to encroachments upon their sovereignty. Um, and four, uh, it had to also find a new path between British and Soviet transcontinental lines. And the path that they sought out here is um, on the map above. Now, the second pathway, uh, which is the, um, excuse me, actually the third pathway, which is the uh, three-dimensional uh, volumetric um, perspective that I'm interested in uh, is titled Technologies of the Gaze. And uh, here users are going to uh, deliberate on the differences between a planar versus a volumetric perspective by comparing an on the ground photograph that you can see on the left uh, from an in the air photograph that you can see on the right, both of them of the Gobi Desert. Now, um, Japanese, uh, Readers were obsessed with this instantaneous, ob the obvious perspective that you would find in uh, various magazines and publications of the 1930s. Uh, they saw, uh, you know, these photographs the way to reveal what is hidden within this perceived geographical vastness of Inner Mongolia. And so somehow these uh, aerial photographs were able to uh, uh, reveal these settlements and these cities within the desert, which are often obscured uh, by the horizon itself. Now, that being said, uh, the aerial technicians themselves were uh, very much aware of the dangers of this particular uh, perspective and the idea that it could possibly um, be all-knowing um, in terms of what it could reveal, um, and that they were concerned with transferring this perspective directly onto a map. Uh, so uh, to demonstrate this in the module, I show how the process of taking photographs and conducting triangulation in order to make aerial maps suggests that this is really not a unified snapshot, ultimately, that ends up on a map, but a diachronic overlapping and constructed representation. So aerial technicians uh, had to account for blur, for tilt, uh, for scale, uh, depending on the ways in which the airplane was moving as it was taking photographs, and then ultimately um, edit those photographs and then uh, overlay them on top of each other in order to derive uh, cartographic information from them. Now, all of these um, photographs ultimately helped Japanese occupiers to envision large-scale environmental interventions. As this map shows, um, which locates the various aerial surveys that were conducted in the year 1938, um, that these, they, they um, use these photographs to uh, plan out land surveys, the timber industry, um, damming projects, uh, and so on. So they were being used in these multiple ways uh, for natural resource uh, extraction. So last but not least, uh, returning to uh, the prompt, um, the second part, um, how does um, uh, the collaborative process of module development, how does it help us write these multivocal spatial histories? Uh, to give you a sense of um, how this process worked for me, 
Uh, first and foremost, the Bodies and Structures uh, Generation 1.0 um, served as a major source of inspiration in terms of what was the realm of possibilities for this particular module. Um, this was a very unfamiliar program to most, if not all of us, in this particular generation of 2.0, and to be able to uh, see what was um, available to us in terms of the tools um, really helped um, us conceive of what uh, our modules could look like. Um, the second is, of, of course, over the, the, the developmental period of the modules themselves, we each had multiple team meetings to draw common themes, uh, beginning with uh, discussing assigned readings on spatial history, and then having uh, multiple talks about um, the ways in which you might link various scalar pages between modules, uh, especially since our modules at first glance might not seem necessarily um, uh, connected to each other. Then last but not least, as we kind of ended with um, our, uh, as we began to finish up our modules themselves, the larger group meetings to um, compile common, a common spatial lexicon became very important. Uh, and so that meant um, out of these um, more seminar style meetings that we were able to uh, find um, uh, a universal or create a universal vocabulary um, in order to be able to um, uh, put together tag maps and the lenses feature to cut across the various modules. Um, all in all, we ended up writing, um, or we could write completely different spatial histories at different scales um, by focusing on a particular place, um, in this case, Inner Mongolia, or a particular medium uh, like photography, or a particular technology here, uh, aviation, um, and see uh, how that they you know, worked in different parts of, of um, the East Asia, uh, both from the early modern and into the modern period, um, and then ultimately uh, create these different perspectives. Thank you very much. This module looks at smallpox vaccinations in Japan in the 1850s that is, before the Meiji Restoration of 1868. So this is a module about a pre-modern society grappling with the problem of public health. I am not a historian of medicine and have approached this topic more from an interest in the social order of Tokugawa Japan, but it turns out the world of microbes can shed a lot of light onto human social relations. The vaccinia virus, which constituted the smallpox vaccine, didn't care about social constructs. Yet it depended on humans to move through time and space. That's the reason it is able to map social structures and reveal, reveal the territories, boundaries, networks and hierarchies that human beings created between each other. The vaccinia virus, of course, lacks agency. It can't even move from human to human on its own. What it can do, however, is to impose its biological rhythm onto humans that wish to manipulate it for their purposes. And when I say biological rhythm, I am thinking of what I call its spatiotemporality. The vaccinia virus needs either a human or an animal, such as a cow or a horse, to infect and it needs to move on from there to another body within a certain time frame, ideally six to eight days after infection. In the 19th century, at least, it couldn't be stored outside the human body for long. The receiving body had to be unvaccinated and without prior history of infection with the human smallpox virus. And this was in the 19th century, typically only the case among young children. The vaccine had to be extracted from a ripe pock on the infected person's body by a trained medical professional. And you see such a professional at work here vaccinating a child on this woodblock print um, created to uh, advertise smallpox vaccinations. All this meant that in order to vaccinate, at least three bodies needed to be present at the same place at exactly the right time. A recently vaccinated child, an unvaccinated child, and a vaccinator. Bringing these bodies together in the right way required all kinds of social negotiations. Now let's enter the module. 
The module starts with um, two introductory pathways. We scroll down here um, to the table of contents. The first one is about the spatiotemporality of both the human smallpox virus and the vaccinia virus. The second, the networks and vehicles of vaccine transmission, is about the social and material infrastructure available to the vaccinia virus to move across space and time. And I want to look into this pathway in a bit more detail. The first page here is about the territoriality of warrior rule. Although Japan was centralized under the Tokugawa shogunate, most of the land had been granted as fiefs to warrior lords and other entities. These fiefs could be of various sizes and in many regions there was territorial fragmentation. In my module I'm focusing on Echizen province, whose lands were held by over 17 different overlords, as you can see on this map. One reason I chose Echizen is that it is a famous case in Japanese medical history. A physician from Fukui domain, this domain here, named Kasahara Ryosaku, was one of the earliest vaccinators in Japan and is something of a legend today, although there is still a lot of research to be done, even on him. A detailed political map like this one is quite useful, but it is also reductive. I'm not just thinking of the physical geography here that is obviously missing, but also of other territorialities and hierarchies that can't easily be displayed in two-dimensional cartography. First, there were the hierarchies and networks of fief holders. For example, some lords in Echizen were higher ranking than others, some were related to each other, and there were also sub-fiefs and some villages were enfiefed to two or more different overlords. So the patches of land we see here were not all equivalent in nature. Second, the political map leaves out crucial information about govern how government worked in the Tokugawa period. Fief holders collected tax revenue and discharged some basic governmental functions, but they didn't bother with most details of day-to-day -day administration. These would be performed by local subjects, organized in village communities, town neighborhoods, as well as many kinds of other occupational associations. The so-called status groups. Many of these groups maintained territories. And these didn't always overlap with the territories of samurai rule. So to understand the introduction of a completely new governmental function, such as smallpox vaccination, we need to look at overlapping territorialities and the interaction between social groups and networks that maintained territories. The next page on this pathway looks at physicians, social bodies and networks in Tokugawa, Japan. Physicians had occupation-based status groups on the local level, but they also maintained regional and even countrywide networks, and such networks became crucial for importing, spreading and perpetuating smallpox vaccinations. Previous scholarship has emphasized the role of physicians' networks in spreading the vaccine within Japan, but there isn't that much research yet on the issue of perpetuation over time. By the way, here you can see a photograph of Kasahara Ryosaku, who is um, kind of the uh, secret hero of my module. Next, I am introducing um, children's bodies, and through these I'm in also... Um, um, talking about the status groups of the common people, especially the villages and town neighborhoods where the children lived. From the perspective of the vaccinia virus, none of these social distinctions matter. Children were just vehicles for the virus. One could also call them vectors. Not so much vectors of disease, but certainly vectors of viral transmission. On the next page, I am introducing some non-human vehicles that were used to bring the vaccine to Echizen. Children's bodies, however, were considered a lot more reliable and were the preferred method of transfer. And the final page on this pathway introduces a different kind of vehicle written records 
that could transfer knowledge. Um, and this starts a pathway that um, cuts across other pathways in the module. Now um, I want to uh, move on to um, the main body of the module, which I called vaccine stories. And that's really where the bulk of the material is to be found. Um, vaccine stories shows how the infrastructure of networks and bodies and other vehicles worked in practice to accommodate the vaccine. It is intentionally open-ended and includes six pathways that um, follow the vaccine's transmission to the province and then within it over time. For example, the first one, long-distance transmission, is about the importation of the vaccine from Batavia to Nagasaki and then on to Fukui. It highlights how physicians' networks and vehicles, both children and other containers, work together to move the vaccine over long distances. The second pathway in the vaccine stories category is about the vaccination clinic in the castle town of Fukui domain. And it demonstrates how the vaccinators created a place to concentrate children's bodies and move and control them to bring them together with vaccinators at exactly the right time. And among other things, I am showing in this module an annotated floor plan of this clinic that users can explore. Um, they can go from room to room and see uh, what, what, what happened there. And this pathway is about placemaking that accommodated the spatio-temporal properties of the vaccine. Now um, let's move back um, to um, vaccine stories and look at the third pathway, which is about sharing vaccines. It shows how vaccinators transmitted vaccines to their colleagues. Um, Japanese vaccinators were open to sharing for many reasons, but they also created some barriers um, so they could maintain expert control over vaccinations and ensure that public trust in vaccinations was not getting eroded by uninitiated actors. As in other parts of the world, public trust in smallpox vaccinations was difficult to gain and easy to lose. So this pathway is about the formation and reinforcement of a professional network that crossed the borders of fiefs. The fourth pathway is called Chains of Bodies, Village Relay in Fukui Domain. And it looks at the issue of center and periphery through the question, how did vaccinators of Fukui Domain try to vaccinate children in the rural areas of the domain, where one could not easily get the right kinds of bodies together at exactly the right time. So this pathway again focuses on vehicles and spatiotemporality of the vaccine from the perspective of short distance rather than long distance transmission and the perspective of perpetuating the vaccine over time in one region. And here you can follow um, the way stations um, um, that mattered in um, transferring the vaccine to certain villages on the coast. Now, pathways five and six look at the case of Ono, which was another domain territory in Echizen province. And they both highlight the theme of territorial rationality. Now, pathway five um, is about vaccinations in the central part of the domain and touches upon issues of coercion and social marginality. The lord of this domain, um, who you can see here, um, saw vaccinations as a way to cultivate population growth and labor power within his territory, and he made vaccination mandatory for his subjects. At least we know that the townspeople got punished if they failed to vaccinate their children. Ono's domain authorities also administered the vaccine to outcasts and remote mountain villagers. And I discuss in what sense 
status boundaries were actually crossed in those scenarios and what meaning the authorities attached to vaccinating these two groups. The sixth pathway, vaccinating the Nishikata exclave, focuses on the crossing of domain borders as well as on infringement of the vaccinators network. Ono's vaccinators did not have a presence in Nishikata, even though um, Nishikata was an exclave of Ono domain. So we see here the main territory of Ono with a castle town and then um, the Nishikata exclave here near the coast. Uh, so one can say in this case the physician's territory and their network and the domain's territory didn't overlap. A local doctor in Nishikata obtained the vaccine illicitly from a vaccinator in another nearby fief and started to vaccinate locals and he even got support for this from an Ono domain official. The pathway discusses how the province-wide network of physicians dealt with this invader and how they built a vaccination infrastructure for Echizen province that made it easier to share vaccines between vaccinators under different jurisdictions. So, in conclusion, this module looks out from the perspective of a useful microbe into the world of human social structures. And it maps that world, not just by following the movement of the vaccine on a conventional map, but also by following its perpetuation over time and by revealing the overlap of territories, the ideas about uh, certain ideas about center and margins and attempts at placemaking. As I said, the module is pretty open-ended and one can continue this kind of mapping by adding more pathways or by finding new links and intersections between the existing pathways. I also hope the many images and translated and annotated primary sources will invite further exploration. What I did here, this module, um, is about the opium trade in the years leading up to the Opium War of 1839-1842. And, and it's a multi-archival analysis of the buying and selling of opium along the littoral of southern Fujian province. Just uh, up the coast from Guangzhou or Canton, the, the only legal port in the, in, in the years before 1843 for for British commerce in China and the epicenter of the illegal opium smuggling trade. Now, opium in the 1830s, for some context, was experiencing a global boom. The drug had ta taken root in Southeast Asia and East Asian markets over the course of the 18th century, passed through the diaspora back up to China on boats, uh, you know, up rivers, over mountains, into villages and cities across the Qing Empire together with the even more popular tobacco smoking habit. Then in the 1820s, fierce new competition on the production end of the opium business inspired the British East India Company to redouble their opium cultivation efforts in Bengal. Each year, British and Parsi, American and Chinese shippers carried more and more chests of opium to China, each chest carrying around 60 balls of the raw drug ready to be boiled down into thousands of doses. So this module addresses this period between 1832 and 1839, when the British opium importers in the Pearl River Delta started partnering with maritime traders in Fujian to relocate a substantive portion of the import market north to the Fujian coast. And my research demonstrates that I, I, roughly around 60% or so of the opium that came to China from India during these years, during the mid and late 1830s, uh, was sold to Chinese buyers from the receiving ships in Fujian. Uh, receiving ships being these stationary British ships that kind of operated as opium and silver warehouses. In, in investigating the history of the people responsible for this trade, the animating questions, the questions I ask of these sources, the animating kind of reason behind a lot of these maps, which I'll get into later, is, is how. How do people make money by buying and selling opium? And the answer to that question 
and, and, and I have more interesting slides later, this is sort of a preamble, apologies. The answer to that question, as, as I currently stand, is a sort of a split between what we might consider, like, uh, for lack of a better word, normal capitalism, and, and then a different sort of consideration that we might consider criminality. Right? The, to the first point, opium is and should be, but hasn't been, um, comparable to other stuff, right? Comparable to cotton or, or, or tea or sugar, right? These globally circulated agricultural items that have histories of capitalism, right? We don't have that for opium. Sort of interesting because it seems like it's, it's, it's so hard to compare to other stuff, right? But it was there with other stuff, right? It was in the same boats. It was in the same banks, the same people trading. So, so why shouldn't we, right, embed opium within its immediate economic context? And so it, part of my answer to kind of how people made money off drugs looks like the history of other stuff, right? Um, you know, opium traders prized fast-moving information, seeking to understand and take advantage of price discrepancies. Um, I can say kind of outside of this, the, the, the temporal scope of this module, my research goes into the 20th century, and the, the long-term kind of trajectory is also comparable to a lot of industries in the sense of horizontal and vertical integration, kind of industry consolidation, and, and, and some stuff like that as well. Right? So, so in some senses, right, how people make money off opium is how they make money off other stuff, right? by buying and selling them in, in the particular logic of, of 1830s you know, capitalism or whatever. And then the other set of considerations and criminality is, is, is somewhat different, right? Opium traders were breaking laws. They were bribing officials. They were usually getting away with it. And understanding those particular dynamics is, is, is I have found, very difficult um, because of the source base, right? Um, especially when right, uh, people who get away with it don't make the archives. And I dive into this problem as a way to introduce the structure of the module itself conceived as a model for introducing students to multi-archival research. Um, the heart of the module are the second and third paths, where I use a, a Chinese and a British archive to build up complementary pictures of the opium trade along the Fujian littoral in the 1830s. And each path, I should also say, is a way for me to kind of experiment with creating what I think are very different kinds of experiences within Scalar, in terms of introducing primary sources, using and thinking about maps and, and storytelling. The first of the two central paths is called The Case Against Shi Ho, a, a Qing document. And this is a translation and reconstruction of a document from the number one historical archives in Beijing, describing the arrest and prosecution of a man named Shi Ho and 110 others for buying and selling opium. Shi Ho was a member of the Shi lineage of Yako village in Jinjiang County between the forts of Xiamen and Quezhou. And in the story told in this case, Shi Ho and a few lineage members grew up a business bringing opium to Fujian from the Pearl River Delta. And then, in 1836, they decided to, uh, according to the language of this case, entice a pair of foreign opium merchants named Big and Little Li to bring foreign ships of opium north to Fujian and thereby import the drug directly to the, kind of the, the armada of local maritime traders ready to buy it. And then I later, just as a, a side note, discovered uh, big and little Lee from this case to be John Reese of Jardine Matheson Company and his brother Thomas Reese of Denton Company, who were stationed in, in this bay um, for many years selling opium. So the way that I've constructed the narrative in this path is a, a much kind of what I think of now as a, a, a traditional linear chronological narrative, um, kind of walking the reader through chunks of the translation of this case grouped on pages strategically to map out kind of particular angles on the history and operations of the, the Sher lineage's opium business. And the path concludes with a reconsideration of the regional geography of statecraft, placing Yako Village and Shenhu Bay within the jurisdictional map of the Qing administration. The second, or, or rather the third path, but the second of the two kind of central paths, uh, the Jardine Matheson Global Network, looks and reads quite differently um, from the first. Rather than a sort of a micro-historical, chronological narrative like the Shir Ho path, this path draws on a, on a wider range of evidence from the Jardine Matheson Company archives in Cambridge. And it reconstructs a set of locations and people and practices that together made up the Jardine Matheson opium smuggling operations. Now, as I've indicated on this slide, there, or as I've tried to, 
visitors can navigate this path in a, in a variety of ways, which, which are really kind of nonlinear, right? By using the map, uh, by using a sort of thematic table of contents pictured here. And there's also an option to kind of scroll through different images from the path and, and through those navigate to the pages. The logic of inclusion here, right? What I've included goes back to that central question that I posed at the beginning. How did people make their money off of opium in Southern Fujian? It's probably relevant to recognize that my outlook on the Jardine Matheson operation is distinctly Fujian centric. In the sense that insofar as this company appears in my own research and writing and, and articles and books, or book, um, they're, they're a vehicle to kind of better understand, they're not the object of study, right? They're, I use Jardine Matheson to try and understand their Chinese partners and, and, and try and figure out who those people were and what they did. So all of this is to say that it, another person researching Jardine Matheson would come up with a different looking map. Right? And, and especially if they were more interested in other places, right? if they were researching Singapore or India or London. Um, so this map is, is very particular. Um, right? it, it Kind of thinking about maybe putting the cart before the horse a little bit here, but, but my response to that prompt about how this module challenges hegemonic cartographic rationality in part relates to this issue right, of how I set about constructing this particular version of the Jardine Matheson Company's operations. This map, as I understand it, reflects my priorities as a researcher as much as it reflects anything else. And before I go into more depth about the issues of cartographic hegemony and the tangible impact of collaboration on the project, I want to just offer one example of the kind of archival triangulation that I hoped to model for students um, and other visitors to this module by organizing it in this way. Um, which I've summarized here on this slide is basically a story of a sustained practice of $10 surcharges on every chest of opium sold by the British opium importers in Fujian's Shenhu Bay. And this practice was widely enough spread that it made its way into the Qing document about the case, and it's all over the Jardine Matheson archive. The Jardine Matheson records have sort of proved, I think, in a lot of ways that this was money that was going to the state in some way. And, and my thinking about this has evolved, you know, I'm, I'm sort of re I'm questioning the utility of the term corruption here, because I do think there's a longer history within uh, kind of historiography on Chinese maritime trade of these sort of informal surcharges on items and things like that. And I think, um, I think this practice is, is, has, has roots in um, kind of um, local traditions of uh, market regulation and stuff like that, that, um, that I maybe could do a better job elucidating. But, but my point in bringing it up here is, is, is that it's um, it's a clear point where the archives disagree about something, right? And I think that's useful um, for students and readers. So on the issue of hegemonic cartographic rationality, um, I have to say, while I, while I didn't enter this project with any radical ideas about this, right? Uh, my, my approach to maps, my thinking about space um, have evolved uh, genuinely uh, over two years of working on this. I'm not a historical writer who is particularly inclined to theory. Um, I, I instead write the, the way that I understand my contribution to the larger body and structures aims in this regard is by making a self-conscious effort to use Google Maps in a particular way, to use Google Maps to elucidate a particular logic, right? And if my approach to evidence from Qing and British archives is to process information according to the question of how people make, make money off opium, then my use of maps within this module should be understood within the same light. In the case against Shiho, maps serve to explain the development of a maritime lineage's opium operations, from the incubation to an almost kingpin regional status, drawing out the ways in which the migration of the opium trade from Guangdong to Fujian in the 1830s was built on pre-existing networks. In the coda to that path, the spatiality of Qing power is explored, kind of signaling Yako village's position within the nested uh, jurisdictional geographies of the Qing territorial government. And then in the path on the Jardine Matheson global network, maps serve to explain that organization's logics of profit from production, shipping, insurance, political lobbying, right down to the receiving ships on the Fujian coast. And my approach here has been fundamentally structured and influenced by the collaborative environment in which Kate and David had us put these together. Um, it was through articulating the specific logics of how to map changes over time from the perspective of an imperial airline 
a disease, a technology, uh, or, or a religious institution. And what I came to understand as I put these together is the sort of temporal fungibility of these mapped out logics. Before some enterprising farmers in Malwa set up an operation to compete with the East India company Opium from Bengal, Bombay was a port city that was irrelevant to the global circulations of opium, a place outside of the considerations of a Scottish opium merchant in Canton or a Fujianese maritime trader. The construction of the Red Rover and other clipper ships permanently altered the significance of what appears to be the exact same sailing route on a Google map from Calcutta to Canton by eliminating the seasonal patterns of shipping and cutting transportation times to an unprecedented low. Um, the creation of steamship routes in later years would once again alter the spatial logic of opium profits and, and any effort to kind of conceptualize the trade in that later period would also require the creation of new maps based on new logics. And I want to add, in addition to challenging my understanding and approach to using maps, this project has seriously challenged my craft as a writer um, and a storyteller. Um, I said before that I'm not theoretically inclined as a history writer, and, and that's maybe an understatement. Um, I like good stories more than anything else, um, and I do think that a well-told story can have its own kind of theoretical impact on a reader. Um, the Jardine Matheson Global Network path in this project completely upended my sensibilities about how to write, um, how to convey an argument, um, how to tell a story. Um, just a brief example, um, without the pressure to tell kind of one particular narrative within the Jardine sources, I, I felt a, a new kind of freedom to include stuff that I felt interesting but couldn't justify placing in the narratives that were essential to the article um, and the book chapter um, the, that I was writing. And here, kind of more than anywhere else, is really where I felt the tangible value of collaboration. Um, and a clear example of that is the, the, the page I wrote on experts, um, which I only conceived of as a result of one of our group conversations, which I think is a really valuable page in the module. So I don't have a, a ton to add here. Um, I hope I haven't gone long. Um, I, I just wanted to sort of throw it out there that this project is also challenging other kinds of rationalities that are, that are fundamental to how many of us read um, and write. Thank you. Okay, we're back. Thanks so much for um, watching the presentations of our three module builders. And now David and I would like to take um, 10 to 15 minutes or so to talk a little bit about um, what we can do with this site. So how does bodies and structures represent the multivocality of space? And, and I phrase this in my most academic language, so what? Well, before we can, um, or as we get into the kind of so what and the how we do this, um, there are some fundamental features of the platform that we use that it helps to understand. So I'm gonna start there. Um, the platform that we built bodies and structures on is called Scalar. It was designed by the Alliance for Networking Visual Culture out of USC, and it's still available via USC. Um, the, one of the key features of Scalar is that the basic unit is a page. Everything in Scalar is a page with its own unique URL. You can arrange these pages in a lot of different ways. So one of the most straightforward ways of arranging them is in a linear pathway. So you can construct narratives. And I think that our, our module builders showed you um, how they have created pathways to construct narratives in their own modules. You can also create um, nonlinear relationships through tags. So tags are also pages and those pages can tag other pages. So here I've got a set of images, a set of screenshots that show an example of a page from Sakura Christmas's module that is tagged by corporation, which is one of the spatial figures that we've identified and we use as a tag throughout the site. And then you could click on that tag and go to the corporation tag page and see all of the other pages that have been tagged by corporation. And they, these pages, as, as, um, as you, you'll see when you explore the site, are um, they cover a, a lot of different topics, right? So you're gonna get a lot of juxtapositions um, through this process. And then um, the tags can also be represented on maps. So if you tag a page that has geospatial metadata, you can also make it show up on a map. A third kind of relationship you can establish between pages is annotations. 
So media, you can annotate media. Um, in this case, uh, what Marin Ehlers has done is, is provide translations of various parts of this um, flyer vaccinating or adver advertising vaccination against smallpox. And then each of these annotations is also its own page. And then finally, you can we create hyperlinks or notes. So here we have a note on Yako Village and you click on it and it actually brings up the whole content from the Yako Village page in Peter Tilly's module. And you can scroll down this note and if you wanted to, you could go to the page itself. So Scalar keeps track of all of the relationships that we've established with um, between pages. And then um, as a collective, we can arrange them in all kinds of different ways to analyze space from multiple multivocal perspective. So I'm going to hand it over to David now, who's going to um, show some examples. So um, one of the things we mentioned earlier is that we're trying to get away from a spatial history that is simply reliant on the cartographic map. And uh, the way that Scalar allows us to visualize page relationships and to uh, develop multiple entry points for the site uh, is one way in which we hope to achieve this goal. Uh, again, we're looking to produce a multivocal spatial history, and so Scalar, with its flat, uh, the flatness of all the different pages, allows for that kind of multivocality to come forward. So we have uh, several ways of accessing the site. Um, one way is simply through a list of the various modules. Currently, in version 1.0, there are seven modules. In version 2.0, there will be 17 modules. Um, and so this is kind of just a straightforward table of contents. Another way is through a complete grid visualization. Since every page in Scalar is uh, a flat page, it, it constitutes a tile in a total grid. And so you can see a color-coded grid uh, of pathway pages, regular text pages, tag pages, notation pages, and media pages. And by scrolling over it, you can see how these pages connect uh, the blue line signifying pathways, the red line signifying tag, uh, tag relationships, for example. Um, a third way on the, the right is the tag map itself. So since we have created tags for various pages, we can uh, visualize these and you can click on a tag and then click on its sub tags down to the level of the pages that are tagged uh, and then track out different kinds of relationships or intersections among these. Um, finally, or another way is the, um, the regular uh, Google map widget. So uh, basically any page that has um, geolocational data, metadata, can be represented on a Google map widget, and therefore it can become a pin on a, a map that the, that the site produces. And we'll talk more about each of these in a bit. Um, and finally, lenses, which we'll come back to, but this is a new development for us that's funded by the NEH. Uh, and it's a way to enable um, both the authors and visitors to the site to curate uh, information in new ways and, and to create new kinds of visualizations. These entry points allow you to come into the site um, in, in via four ways that we've designed. For 2.0 though, we've introduced or we are introducing a totally new tool that we've developed with, um, with the team at Scalar, which allows you as a user or as a reader to actually create your own maps of the site's content. So put it together um, in, in a new way um, to make your own critical interventions in the site's structures, figure out what have we missed, <laughs> figure out what's cool there that we didn't see, um, and, and make that visible to yourself, but also then potentially share it with us and the rest of the users of the site. Um, let me, can I just jump in for one second there? So. Um, Kate talked about this is a way for users to, to map things in different ways. And this is a crucial concept for, up, for us. We really think about mapping as wayfinding mm -hmm. um, as opposed to simply representing things on a flat cartographic um, image. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think this differentiates us from a lot of sites that are GIS oriented. Um, and so it's, this is kind of a more phenomenological approach for people to encounter the site and encounter the space and make their way through it and make their own meanings from it, just as we hope people will be able to see how individuals and groups in the past also encountered space and place and made meanings out of it. Yes, exactly. It's like multivocal, but and then also multi-layered, yeah. uh, thinking of the site itself as, as a place, right? Um, so so one of the ways, here's a, here's a very um, straightforward example of, of one thing you could do with lenses. Um, so lenses allows you to combine the site's content in new ways and, and then to visualize it. 
or I should say create a slice of content and visualize it. So here, what we've done is we've used the word cloud visualization um, and we've visualized the words that are on the pages that make up Sakura Christmas's module, um, Imperial Japan up in the air. And then we've combined that with the pages that make up um, uh, Emily Chapman's module, One Family's Photographs, which is about, which is about a family album produced in Japan's early post-war period in the 1950s and 1960s. And the reason why we threw together these two, these two modules was because they both deal with photography, but in very different ways and in very different contexts. And we wanted to see are some, are some of these words, some of the content overlapping. Um, so you can see on this word cloud, the kinds of words that come up. Um, what I noticed because I am kind of a transportation nerd was um, that aviation and car are both words that come up when we talk about photography in the 20th century. Um, so cars are not particularly visible when you're, when you're thinking about photography in Socrates module, but they are um, hugely important when, when we're talking about photography in Emily's module. And so here's one way that you can kind of see these things together and they encourage you to, to think or to rethink some of the content you may have encountered previously. A second example that we put together um, is an example of what we call reading across places. And this is, this is a concept that we use um, or that we, that we articulated as a way of describing both the action and I guess the virtue of, <laughs> of, of juxtaposition. So, so the site allows you to like look at the same concept in a lot of different contexts, basically. Um, and to do so rather than like, you know, putting 12 books on your shelf or flipping back and forth through a million indexes, you can just throw them all onto the same page. So here we did a word cloud of all of the pages that contain the word network. And then you can also see one we did um, a word cloud of all the pages that contain the word move just to see what are the other words that people use when they're talking about networks in a variety of historical periods um, and what and ditto for um, for the word move. And so you can see um, some of the things that that come up, you know, in the network, right, we're talking about opium, this is very famous network in East Asian history, um, but also drugstore franchises, not necessarily something that people think about. Um, a lot vaccination networks, right, um, from Marin's module. So we have, you know, as historians who and scholars who work in in particular time and place context, we have our own ideas of what a network is, right? But reading across places, reading movement across places and across time periods, shakes us out of our our kind of practiced wisdom, right, and gets us to think a little more deeply about well, really, what is a network? What are the possibilities for this kind of for this kind of spatial structure? David? So another way in which we can read across places is to take the same set of pages uh, that contain network and show them as a list. And here, um, there are 41 hits that came back on this. And, and so this is uh, one portion of that. But in a list form, we can get uh, a more granular view of each. We can get the title, we can get the description, we can get the author, we can actually, if we wanted to look at the site itself and its history, we can get who the last editor of any given page was and the version of the page. So um, this permits us to, uh, to treat both the content and the site itself as objects of inquiry. And uh, one of the new tools that's come along with the lenses is the inspector tool, which you see on the right of this screenshot. You can open up the inspector and when you highlight a page in the list, it will bring up all the details about that page. So it'll give you not only the URL for the page, but also any metadata terms that have been applied to it. And as you can see here, this page actually contains uh, a number of lat long uh, terms as well as a number of place names. And so if you were to use this lens and pull up this list and then use the inspector to open up this page, you might be prompted to then copy one of the lat long pairs into a search and create a lens based on that to see how a particular geolocation might um, be read across places in our in our site as well. Mm -hmm. Right. You could put in you could put in the lat long coordinates and say, give me every page that's within 50 miles of this. Yeah. Yeah. Let's see what's happening there. And so another way in which we, we do use um, cartography is, is through um, the, the Google map and the, the pinning of, of different uh, pages. But um, one of the things that we try to do with that then is to use this to evoke a sense of place and to deep map any particular location. And so an example of that would be, for example, Shanghai, where um, you know, if you zoom in, 
you will see that we have a number of pins on Shanghai. And if you open them up, then you can see right here that there, are, um, in this example, there are three very different kinds of treatments of Shanghai. One comes from my module. It's about um, migration of women between Japan and China. Another comes from uh, Noriko Aso's module on Mitsukoshi department store and photographs of Shanghai that appeared in that magazine, uh, in that department store's magazine. And then one from Peter Tilley's uh, discussion of the Jardine Matheson network in his module on opium. So again, a single place has multiple meanings and multiple histories. And, and um, this is one way in which we hope that the, the actual map can be used to develop that sense of place. So what does bodies and structures contribute to the scholarship on spatial history, on spatial humanities, um, and to uh, the study of modern East Asian history? For us, the intervention is primarily, or I should say one of the biggest interventions is ontological. It, ha it has to do with how we think about making knowledge about space, spatial history, and modern East Asia. So we find ourselves returning often um, to this line from um, Richard White's very, very famous essay, What is Spatial History? Visualization and spatial history are not about producing things that you have discovered. It is a means of doing research. It generates questions that might otherwise go unasked. It reveals historical relations that might otherwise go unnoticed. And it undermines or substantiates stories upon which we build our own versions of the past. Bodies and Structures does contain discoveries. These modules are treasure troves of, um, of close analysis of primary sources and other, you know, kind of, uh, important historical figures and events and infrastructures that we don't see written about very often. All of the modules contain translated primary sources that are all available um, through open access Creative Commons licenses. And more and like sort of in addition to this, um, these discoveries that I think you sort of got a sense of with our panelists present with our module builders presentations, um, it's also a place where you can research in new ways, right? And this is, and this is the, the big um, contribution that we're making here with this site. It's also a site where you can write in new ways. Um, one of the things that we wanted to do with Bodies and Structures and with Scalar was to get away from the traditional um, linear narrative form. And so there are, there are various digital humanities tools and, and projects that are out there that basically invite you in and then push you in a single direction, whether it be downward or, or forward. And we really wanted to get to the kind of non-linearity uh, of spatial history. And so um, in addition to the, the tags and the, the notations and the pathways, there are other ways in which we encourage uh, our module builders to think about their projects as not simply a single linear story, but as a space that can branch off in different directions, almost rhizomatically connect to other places. Um, and uh, while that's sort of the, the promise of the site, um, it is also a challenge because um, it has to be managed on the side of the editors. It also has to be managed by the user who visits. And so Paula Curtis, who kindly reviewed our site for uh, reviews in digital humanities, uh, wrote, the at times bewildering complexity of the content of bodies and structures can be a hindrance for non-specialist or novice users, but it is also the point of the project. The historical actors never experience space, uh, ex excuse me, experience space and place in ways that do not always read as straightforward as a typical textbook or monograph might lead us to believe. It suggests that we should consider what diving deeply into these fragments and our own travels through these moments can tell us. Again, um, it's the phenomenological dimension of this that we think has a lot of potential. So please come join our conversation. Um, take a look if you haven't already at the 1.0 version of the site, which is available at bodiesandstructures.org. And um, keep your eyes out on Twitter and HDET and elsewhere for the release of Bodies and Structures 2.0, which we anticipate um, um, finalizing in September 2021. Um, and as always, if you have any questions or comments, um, please feel free to write to us at bodiesandstructures at gmail.com. We always want user feedback. Yes. <laughs> And now we will um, switch over to, to comments from our discussant, John Corrigan, and then a brief roundtable with all the participants. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Okay, so thanks David and Kate for inviting me to this panel uh, where I get the chance to think about the spatial humanities with scholars who are doing it, which means doing dynamic and interactive digital environments that mediate their research data to the rest of us, even as they are theorizing what it is that they are doing. So uh, I love this project, Bodies and Structures. I'm looking forward to seeing the 2.0 when it drops in September. I hope it's still September. Um, there are a lot of things I like about it, uh, but I do want to mention at the outset that the introductory essay is first rate. It's beautifully articulate without being tedious. It covers a lot of ground. It draws readers into thinking about a wide range of theor theoretical constructs and uh, offers interpretive opportunities. Uh, there's other things I like about bodies and structures, but I'll come back to that. I want to mention first the three modules that we have before us. Uh, in the foreground of the plan of bodies and structures is a commitment to exploit exploratory spatial analysis as a deliberate means to compromising the testimony of conventional cartography, by which I mean a program of mapping that invokes the quantitative authority of latitude and longitude in service to a certain kind of mathematical scientism that spoils familiar cartographic narratives. Some pre presenters have referred to their interest in challenging hegemonic cartographic rationality when outlining the aims of their modules. Such rationality is engraved in the images of global, regional, national, local space, whether we mean by that global latitude and longitude generally, or the points, lines, and polygons that are key to Latin law that denominate for a discourse epitomized by Google Maps, human spaces. The three modules that we are looking at exemplify some of the possibilities and challenges of moving through conventional construals of space into deeper engagements with the specifically human terrain that we claim as humanity scholars as the proving ground for our research. These three modules then as spatial humanities forays take different paths in assembling their data. Sakura Christmas offers us the opportunity to reflect on how the aerial perspective as it was pursued by Imperial Japan enabled critical reflection about human habitation and migration that disrupted thinking about space implicit in the railway map that up in the air perspective in her nicely chosen words, I hope you get a lot of mileage out of that because you deserve it, uh, contributed in obvious ways to advance Japanese plans to possess natural resources and to initiate and manage incursion. But more subtly, it functioned to advance conceptualizations of space as all but borderless. That is, it fostered a notion of a continuous physical geography, a networked empire from metropole to receding periphery that supplanted the nationally or regionally bound railway map. Marin Ehlers' focus on smallpox vaccinations in mid 19th century Japan also instructs us about movement through space, not just by people, but by a virus. The virus, as she points out, had its own biological rhythms and its own history of transmission from one body to another. The history of vaccination, especially in places like Eshizen, reveals in Ehlers' telling how the vagaries of viral transmission were braided with the superintendence of a response to the virus, namely the dissemination of the vaccine. That braiding was volatile. The vaccine carried from one place to another in inanimate or animate vehicles jars as well as children, traveled somewhat like the virus, but never as freely. We discovered though, that it navigated through the social worlds of the Japanese in surprising and sometimes unpredictable ways, crossing status lines, revealing ambiguities or complexities in social boundary, prompting rethinking of center and periphery and leading to the construction of networks that challenged spatial conceptions of the thief. 
such a vaccination history then discloses both the fragility and the malleability of place, as well as the adaptability of spatial thinking. Peter Tilly tells us about the opium trade in China during the 1830s. That includes consideration of the trade routes, which were changing uh, from India to Guangzhou and then onward from there to points north of the Pearl River Delta. Understanding the opium trade also requires recognition of opium as a commodity among other commodities. As far as its marketing and its return on investment, keeping in mind, of course, that the sale of opium was illegal. Tilly points out how market-driven changes in the opium trade themselves changed the map significantly, not only in terms of the long geography, the route from India to China that cut out Bombay, but also the emergence of trade networks in literal China. The opium trade configured space differently disregarding previously established social networks and creating new ones with new spatial centers and peripheries and new implications for Chinese nationality and presumably imperialism. In short, the opium trade broached its own spatial logic grounded in the elements of production, financing, shipment, and distribution of opium. So I'm excited about these projects first because of the way they've leveraged the various creators' historical expertise to spark critical reflection about how people inhabit space. And that includes how people conceptualize space, how they order and reorder it. I also like how these projects have found ways to put human agency and planning in relationship to things, things which might in the end have their own agency but in a rather different sense than what we mean when we speak of human agency, the transmission of disease, the behaving of a market, and the view from the air, all in some ways are joined to human activity. We can, after all, wear a mask, some of us, <laughs> to slow the transmission of a virus. We can intervene to an extent in the machinery of the market. And of course, we invented the airplane. But there is a non-human thingness to all of these three events that helps to establish a viewpoint with regard to space that holds potential for undermining or even subverting familiar thinking about space. Just as some clusters of California counties have become very different spaces after a season of record fires, so does Etchizen look different when a smallpox threat leads to the breaching of status boundaries. But one contribution that's especially promising about this research is its collaborative design, which informs bodies and structures in several ways. As these scholars note, there is a productive authorial collaboration. Engaging others' work about space affects one's own thinking. More pointedly, it is the fact that the site is engineered in such a way as to foster intersections in research about Japan and the space of the empire so the interactive tag map, which supplies dynamic visualization of networks among the subject topic tabs. The complete grid visualization, a great interactive engine that likewise discloses linkage, linkages between all of the contents of the modules, including references and media files, as well as tag metadata. And then a geotag map that locates the modules and their topics in a conventional Google map. How does all of that create collaboration that will enhance the likelihood that site users and authors will arrive at new understandings of space? Not just how spatial frontiers changed, how social institutions were more or less involved in spatial thinking, or how technology caused space-time compressions. All of those are salutary outcomes for this research, but how do these innovations get really to the heart of the spatial humanities as a disruptive exercise? How do they challenge conventional cartographies by enabling perspectives that have been overlooked or deliberately repressed? Specifically, 
How do they, as potential technologies relevant to the ongoing ethical turn in the humanities, enable multivocality in our representations of space? How do they assist us in properly framing the right questions? Whose space and on what scale? And crucially, how are things, rivers, seas, deserts, trade winds, opium routes, a virus, agentive, and at the same time shaped as far as their role in defining space by human desires, human habits, and human inventions? How do things and people make space together? And of course, how do people of different backgrounds make space together? A deep map, which is a core desideratum of the spatial humanities, is a map that is open-ended, polyvocal, dynamic, and reflexive. It's a tall order, and I don't think it would have been possible until recent decades. In my collection of books that were the precursors to the rich digital deep maps of today, I'm referring to those books everyone has seen with transparent plastic pages that could be turned progressively as overlays to show an increasingly more complex space. In those uh, proto deep maps, there was no polyvocality, only more layers of the same data about institutions, demographics, and the weather. Because the book still had one author. Digital products, such as bodies and structures, encompass individual products, certainly, but also make possible the interrelationship of numerous different perspectives as the projects are linked through tags, grids, and other integrative technologies. Uh, what that does, of course, in the case of bodies and structures, is prompt rethinkings of the space mm -hmm. of the Japanese empire. It does that by bringing together a wider range of voices, the author's voices, certainly, but especially the voices of those whom the researchers have studied. Does the spatial imagination of someone in a drugstore in Northern Japan have something to do with the view from the air at that same time? Does the remaking of social space during a smallpox epidemic have something to do with the remaking of space by the proliferation of the opium trade? Bodies and Structures enables progress in thinking about that. It's a platform that sets the table for critical interrogation of our definitions of space in general and Japanese space in particular. So how does the spatial humanities as it is, as it is exemplified in bodies and structures and in the individual modules enhance our capabilities as historians? Peter Tilly, I think, teased a few thoughts about this at the end of his presentation, but it's a topic that deserves robust discussion. My own sense is that when we complicate our understandings of space, we complicate the stories we can tell. The deep map can be an important step, but the outcome really that we should be aiming at is a spatial narrative. That is a narrative about the past that leverages the open-endedness and the polyvocality of the spatial humanities and the often surprising insights derived from that enterprise to create narratives that are more inclusive, that bridge gaps, and that challenge familiar categories of space and time as historical constructs that privilege some voices and marginalize others. In other words, a spatial narrative can be one in which time is linear, cyclical, fragmented, and overlapping all at the same time, and space similarly in flux. I know that sounds daunting. I know it's hard to imagine that sort of historical writing, but historical narratives can evolve in terms of their style, their process, and their aims. 30 years ago, when Simon Shama published Dead Certainties, his interweaving of fact and supposition in creating a narrative, it was viewed skeptically by many. But here we are decades later, where we find Mamiya Hartman writing eloquently about the silent spaces in the history of slavery, the spaces where the archives do not tread, 
by drawing on her own experiences to imagine what those spaces might look like in what she calls a critical fabulation. The spatial narrative is related to the approach that Sham and Hartman have attempted. Fabulation is not the right word to describe it. I don't think I'd wanna go there. But a spatial narrative recognizes the monovocality of the archive, its tyranny and its allure, just as the map, as we have known it, can embody what some bodies and structures participants call its hegemonic rationality. The spatial humanities challenges the notion of archive, as historians as a whole increasingly have begun to do, and recognizes the gaps, what seems to be absent in representations of the spaces and places of the past. But unlike the forays of Shama and Hartman, the spatial humanities has a superpower that can deploy technology to challenge the map as we know it. The spatial humanities can redefine the category of space offering in place of conventional maps a wide range of interactive metadata tagged arrays, geotagged maps, grid visualizations, embedded media, and other digital articulations of space, all the way on up to virtual immersive environments, such as caves, and more of these are being built all the time, where persons can enter a world where sights, sounds, and smells disrupt our experience of what we thought we knew about a place. Technology is no silver bullet, and it's not the only tool in the spatial humanities toolbox, but a really well-conceived project such as Bodies and Structures suggests how technology can contribute to narrating better histories and to pushing the boundaries of what we mean by space and time as it does so. So thanks to Sakura, Mara, and Peter for their fascinating research, and to David and Kate especially for pioneering this great approach to understanding not just Japan and its empire, but the broader project of how space and place are conceptualized and exploited as categories in the telling of history. Well, thank you, John, for those, those comments. We really appreciate it. We appreciate all the effort you've, uh, you've put into um, grappling with bodies and structures, which is kind of an unwieldy um, enterprise. Um, and uh, I'm glad that you were able to, to be here to share your thoughts with us. Perhaps we'd like to ask our three um, presenters if they have any responses to John's comments. Okay, here I am. Um, I just wanted to say um, very quickly, um, thank you, John, for these great comments. It's always a pleasure to hear a discussion, describe your project or your ideas in new vocabulary that you think you might actually use in the future. Um, <laughs> as you were speaking of uh, braiding and of inanimate containers, I thought, yeah, that's it. I will, <laughs> I might rephrase it in those terms. Uh, thank you so much for those, you know, uh, just to echo everyone else, really eloquent comments that um, articulate sort of, I don't know, the, the maze that we've been <laughs> trying to work ourselves through in our modules. Um, uh, yeah, I, um, you know, this is this particular project, um, not even speaking at the level of the individual modules, but um, John, when you said that time could be linear, cyclical, fragmented, overlapping, all at the same time, right, simultaneously, um, I think really gets at the heart of how uh, disruptive and disorienting it is as historians to try to um, take on a project like this uh, mm -hmm. because of the fact that we are so, of course, used to ordering our narratives in specific ways. Um, and to have to suddenly not do that is both liberating, but also terrifying, mm -hmm. um, if I could if I could put that out there. Um, and so, um, yeah, I, I really appreciate um, that, um, that. I mean, I appreciate all the comments, but that particular <laughs> comment really um, stuck out to me. So, yeah. That's really I think, I think it's a really important and sometimes overlooked um, component of what the spatial humanities does is that, I mean, we're really using a, a kind of, um, approach to space to understand time as well. Mm -hmm. it's, 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 a, it's a great thing for historians, I think, because it gives you something to hold on to 
mm -hmm. which is the sort of the technological mm -hmm. renderings of space that we can um, manipulatively exploit mm -hmm. and try to get to new places and everything with that space and the people who inhabit it. But by holding on to that, we also get traction, I think, in thinking about time and you know the, the, the way in which time gets compressed or sometimes the way in which it gets lengthened, you mm -hmm. know. Certainly, uh, viewed from the air is one way of talking about, you know, time-space compression. It's a beautiful mm -hmm. example. Anything from bird's eye view is always great because it intrinsically compresses time as well as space. Mm -hmm. But you know, other aspects of this as well. You know, we can you know um, move away in in, uh, in in small steps uh, from just the spatial stuff to start talking about what time means and what is the history, for example, of the movement of a virus around Japan. Mm -hmm. What is it really supposed to do? I think one of the uh, terms that I in, at least intuited was fundamental to your conversations is scale. Mm -hmm. And I, I think it's something that historians have you know, been trying to come to terms with a little bit more as so-called global history or what used to be called a kind of comparative regional history or whatever begins to rethink what it is and get some traction again. Mm -hmm. But um, time is a really important part of that. You know, what we're talking about when we talk about space and time, but it all leads to scale. You know, mm -hmm. it's the scale of how does how does space look and how does time feel mm -hmm. in these sort of different global scales or hugely mm -hmm. regional scales like imperial scale. Yeah. Yeah, I think on the question of time, you know, one of the things I like to ask is where is time, right? Where where is 1926, for example, which was the, the title of a, a book about, you know, the, the attempted in print version to, to try and uh, do some of the things that we're doing. Um, because you know, in terms of a homogeneous chronometric time, 1926 is the same everywhere, and yet 1926 certainly feels different to um, the people in, say, Shell and Wu's module on uh, the Mongolian frontier than it would to somebody in Tokyo um, in 1926, uh, and even to different groups within Tokyo. So how we can use space to think about um, these homogenizing concepts and then break them apart. And, and space itself, of course, you know, as John points out, the absolute space is homogenous space and every locality is just another dot within it. Uh, but what I think we can do is, is show how each location really does have these multivalent meanings and temporal developments uh, and then put them into conversation with each other to think of different ways of spatializing. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, if 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 space is poly polyvocal or, or multivocal, then time has to be as as well. You can't actually have one without the other. And so it's it is it is kind of incredible to think about, you know, how and John, this was one of the points you're making, like how embracing the spatial humanities as like a as a quote disruptive mechanism actually really does you know, in a kind of like matrix moment blow up so many um, so many traditions of our modern historical practice and their traditions that 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 it's not that we're the first ones to point out how frustrating they are. I mean, like the overview essay, um, um, thanks for loving it. I feel particularly proud of it as well. Um, um, it, that was such a fun thing to write. And as somebody pointed out to me, like it draws on a lot of scholarship from like the 1980s and 1990s. So we're not at some level saying anything that is radically new, but there is there is a huge gap between saying that space is multivocal, it's the simultaneity of stories so far, and then actually making that appear in a way that is that is useful to people as, as students and as, as um, researchers and just as you know, readers who are interested in, in good historical narratives. I mean, Peter, you made this, this point. Um, um, we get into this work because we like to read stories about the past at some level, you know, and it's and it's a real challenge to 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 you know make the the richness of human life tangible without losing the thread of a particular narrative so so that's um I, it's great to kind of feel seen on on that front like that's the work that's the work we're doing i, I love what you said at the beginning we're exploiting exploratory research right to <laughs> to if we just if we just assume from the get-go that there is no one way of experiencing any particular space you know moment in history mm -hmm. or any particular place then you end up with this kind of messy world but it it you know paradoxically ironically or just obviously reflects the ways that we actually do live our lives and so in that sense it's it should be um i don't know comforting like it's just the messiness of our everyday life is actually the messiness of, of human life at some level mm -hmm.